Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And today we are in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Hope you had a good weekend. Um, I know that today is kind of a dreary, miserable looking day again, but uh, we're looking forward to getting into this fall weather and hopefully some crisp weather. And I'm just enjoying watching the leaves change. So Ecclesiastes chapter 10, and we're looking at verses 10 through 12 together. Let's read it. It says, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow him up. Now, when we get into this passage, verses 10 through 12, he's actually kind of setting the stage for a discussion that he's going to have on foolishness. And he's going to focus on foolishness when it comes to how we speak to people. So when we come to the text in front of us, first of all, we want to just get a little summary statement and look at the illustrations that Solomon uses. First of all, this the summary statement. Success comes through a combination of hard work and skill, not just hard work. Let me say that again. Success comes from a combination of hard work and skill, not just hard work. I think we could also say that it's not just skill that causes someone to be successful. It's a combination. So if someone if someone has a lot of ability, but they're not willing to work hard, they're not going to be successful at what they do. On the other side, if a person's willing to work really hard, but they don't actually have skill in something that they're trying to work at, they're also going to experience frustration. He's going to give two illustrations of this. One illustration is going to talk about how if we don't have skill or maybe we don't have the right tools to do what we're doing, we're going to end up being frustrated and have to expend way more energy than you'd expect. In his second illustration, he's going to talk about how a lack of skill is going to cost someone dearly and it's actually going to endanger them as a person. So the first illustration we find in verse 10, and it's the illustration of splitting wood. Now today I decided to wear my lumberjack uh, flannel shirt because we're in the fall, we're getting ready to get fire season going, we heat our house with wood in the winter. Over the last several months, during the, the time that we were locked down and weren't supposed to really go out, I decided to really spend a lot of time working on my wood pile. In fact, this year we split and stacked eight cords of wood, so I think that that should get us through the winter. That's my hope. Well, in that process, what, what we learned as we were doing that, and I say we, my boys helped me a little bit, not so much with the splitting, but with the stacking. But what I learned is that you have to have the right tool to do the work. And it's not just about having the right tool, but the right tool has to be sharpened and ready to use. Here's what he says in verse 10. He says, if the iron be blunt, we do not, and we do not wet the edge, then we must put more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Basically, what Solomon is saying here is if you're splitting wood, you need to use an axe that's sharp. And if you have an ax that's not sharp, it's going to take you way longer to do the work. You're going to expend way more energy than you needed to on the pro project. He's saying, listen, it's not that I'm telling you you shouldn't be working hard. What I'm saying is if you're going to work hard, use the right instrument. Use an instrument that is up to the task. In fact, something as simple as taking a regular axe to split that much wood and then taking an axe that's weighted, like a maul axe, is going to make a huge difference. There are some pieces of wood that it would take me 20 minutes to split it using a regular axe. But if I have a wedge and I have a sledgehammer or I have a maul axe, then I can split that piece of wood in a few minutes. The idea is that a sharp instrument, an instrument that's up to the task, is a huge part of the battle of being successful in what we do. In this simple illustration, he's saying, look, don't try to split wood with a dull ax. You're gonna waste energy. You're not going to accomplish the same amount with the labor that you expend. You're gonna tear up your hands. You're gonna have to work harder and longer. Your body's gonna be really damaged by all the labor that you're putting into this with the wrong instrument. And ultimately, you're going to waste your energies. That's what he's saying. So that's the first illustration. Let's keep that one in mind because it's important for really where Solomon's going with this discussion. The second illustration that he uses is really interesting. And this isn't one that I can actually identify with personally. Probably very few, if any of you who are listening to this video can personally identify this. 
but you can you've seen this happen before maybe on television or some other place and that's the snake charmer in verse 11 he says surely the the serpent will bite without enchantment let that phrase sink in the serpent will bite without enchantment we've all seen uh the the situation where you have a cobra and you have someone who's playing music and they're playing music so that the serpent won't bite what happens if the person gets close to that cobra and they're not playing the music to it to basically enchant the snake well what's going to end up happening is the snake's going to bite the person who's standing in front of them and the ultimate outcome of that if it's a cobra is that the person's going to get extremely sick or they're going to die because that's a venomous serpent solomon says if you don't charm the snake it's going to bite you and if it bites you you're going to be in trouble and so in this illustration, he's basically going to say, don't get into something that you're not prepared to get into. Don't start a task that you're not ready to actually go and do. You're going to get bit. And in the end, you're going to be in huge trouble. And once it happens, it's going to be too late. So he uses these two very simple illustrations, splitting wood and a snake charmer, to ultimately lay a foundation for a discussion that he's going to have about the tongue and how we speak with people and so the third illustration that he uses is dealing with interpersonal skills and this is really where solomon's going to spend his time he's not so much interested in somebody splitting wood and somebody charming a snake as he is about someone having good people skills a good use of their tongue and he's going to use those two illustrations to talk about what happens when people don't use their tongue wisely in interpersonal relationships in verse 12 he says the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious that word gracious is extremely important that means they're kind that means they're not harsh they're not blunt they're not arrogant they're not rude it means that this is a person that the way they speak to people demonstrates care demonstrates concern demonstrates humility demonstrates that they respect that individual, that they recognize the dignity of that person, even when they disagree with them. He says, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. Now, when he says he's going to swallow up himself, he doesn't say that the lips of a fool swallow up the person that they're going on the offensive toward. He said the lips of a, of a fool actually swallow up the fool. That means that when a person does not use their words skillfully in interpersonal relationships, the ultimate person they hurt is not just the person they're speaking to or just the person they're speaking about, but they actually hurt themselves. And you say, well, how does this statement about interpersonal relationships and how we use our tongue, how is this in any way connected to splitting wood and a snake charmer? And the answer is they actually are in Solomon's mind. Because what he's going to do is going to show that the way that we use our tongue is going to have the same outcome, if it's not used wisely, of the person who's splitting wood and expending way more energy than they need to because they've not sharpened the axe. They're going to cause a lot of damage to themselves because they've not prepared to do the work. And he is going to liken it to what happens to the snake charmer who doesn't charm the snake and he gets bit. And ultimately he's in trouble and there's nothing he can do to help himself. In other words, he's saying that dealing with people takes skill. And not just skill, but skill that if we don't have it and we step into situations that we're not prepared for, we're going to have to expend way more energy in those circumstances than we would have needed had we just kept our mouth shut or just use a little bit more grace and skill in the way that we spoke to people. We're going to create unnecessary problems by an unskillful and foolish use of our words when we're relating to other people. He's emphasizing that our words matter, that our words have an effect, and that our words can have a positive effect or our words can have a negative effect. And so he says basically that the way that we need to relate to others is in grace and humility, and in kindness. Let me put it very simply. When we don't use our words with grace, we're going to have one of two problems. And these two problems are reflected in the two illustrations that Solomon uses. 
The first is the problem that comes when we're splitting wood with a dull axe. The idea is that you're going to have to work a lot harder because the instrument that you're using is not up to the task. Just like a person who's splitting wood with a dull axe, a person who has poor people skills, who is relating to people, is going to be a person who has to expend way more energy resolving conflicts that they've created by the use of their words than they would if they had just used their words wisely. And by the way, haven't we learned this in life? You know, think about a situation where you're dealing with a person and the way that you use your words is foolish. It's without grace. It's not humble. It's not kind. It's not wise. What do you have to do when a conflict arises as a result of the foolish use of your words? You have to go back and apologize. Well, what happens when the person won't accept your apology? What do you have left to do? It's going to take years potentially to resolve broken relationships. It may take months to be able to resolve a conflict between two people that was completely unnecessary. The idea is that you're going to have to do damage control. The idea is you're going to have to work extra hard to resolve the conflict. And basically what Solomon's saying is if you go out to split wood with a dull axe, you do way more work. And if you go and you resolve conflicts with people without grace and humility, guess what? You have to do way more work because you have to make up for lost ground in the way that you handle yourself. The second illustration that he uses is that of charming the snake. And the idea is he's saying this, we may not be able to repair the damage that's been done because of the use of our words. You know, if a person's bit by a venomous snake, he may not be able to get the help that he needs in time. It may be that the damage is already done and the situation is beyond repair. And Solomon's saying the same thing is true when a person uses their words unwisely. It's possible that not only will you have to work harder to resolve the issue, but that hard work may not be enough to actually overcome what's been done by the damage of our words. In other words, we have to be skillful before we go into the situation so that we can actually see positive outcomes in what we do. So you may ask, well, how do you practically apply these verses? How can we take these simple principles, these simple illustrations, and how can we actually live in the light of them effectively today? Let me give you a couple of simple thoughts I jotted down today. The first is this, know your limits. If you've not developed a certain skill set when it comes to dealing with people, then don't put yourself in situations that are going to get yourself in trouble. I know that that might sound like a, an overly simplistic thing, but the idea is this. We need to know our limits. We need to know what we're ready to handle. We need to know what we're prepared to do. Now, that, that doesn't mean that there are certain contexts that at the moment we don't go into and we never go into them. I'm not suggesting that. But what I'm saying is when you recognize a deficiency and you know where you struggle and you know where you're weak, then you need to address those issues before you get in those situations so that you don't create damage and you don't have to create unnecessary work and difficulty for yourself and others. Number two, we need to all, I don't, it doesn't matter the level of skill that you have when dealing with people as you stand today here. We all need to improve in areas where we're weak. Every single one of us has areas when it comes to our interpersonal relationships that need to improve. We need to grow in these areas. We need to grow in our ability to <coughs> use our words wisely and skillfully and graciously so that we can have positive resolutions with the people around us. And so it's not just about knowing our limits, but it's recognizing that we are all in need of continued growth in these areas. And the third thing I'm going to mention is this. Take time to prepare yourself so that you don't harm yourself and others. You know, when we use our words unwisely, we use them to the detriment of the people around us. But it's not just to their detriment, it's to our own as well. And so it's extremely important that just like we would sharpen an axe before we go and split wood, and just like we would want to make sure if we were a snake charmer, not that anybody would ever want to do that, okay? I certainly wouldn't want to. We would make sure that we knew what we were doing before we stepped into the situation in the same way that you would prepare in those two illustrations. We need to prepare ourselves before we step into situations that we will encounter. I hope that this has been a help to you this morning. I hope it's given you something to think about. It's not meant to be sharp or discouraging. It's meant to be 
encouraging, uh, uplifting. The reality is all of us need to grow in these areas. And the more skillful that we become in our interpersonal relationships, the better relationships we'll have. The better opportunity we'll have to invest in the lives of other people. The better opportunity we're going to have to be able to actually grow and thrive and have deep relationships and have a strengthened community in the places that God places us. So I hope that this will be a challenge to you in those ways. I pray that you will personally grow in your ability to relate to other people. God wants to use you in other people's lives. He wants you to be a blessing to others, an instrument through which he works. And so let's pray to that end. Let's bow together for prayer this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be reminded of the importance of being prepared to go into interpersonal encounters that we have with others. Father, help us to become skillful in how we use our words. Help us to be gracious people, humble people, kind people. I pray that you'd help us to make good choices with how we relate to others so we won't have to repair the damage done by foolish and impulsive behavior. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's been good to talk to you this morning. I hope that you have a great day, and I hope that you have a wonderful week. Lord willing, tomorrow we will continue our discussion in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Have a great day. Bye now.